Okay, welcome back. This is part two. I figured breaking this up into chunks that were digestible and giving them decent titles might be better than just having one enormously long stream about, oh, this is Visviva, and here's how I apply it here, and here's how I apply it there, and here's how I apply it there, and here it is flying. And so we have already, in the previous, uh, gone over the Visviva equation and how we can use it to ter determine our velocity if we know the periapsis, the apoapsis, and our current altitude. Uh, we also need to know our the body we're, we're in orbit around, which gives us the uh, gravitational field strength and the radius of the body, which we have to add to our altitudes to get radius values. So we've got Fees Viva under our belt. We have made some code that is going to be just never touched again because it's just perfect, right? That's the goal of all software engineering is you create these little nuggets of code that do their thing perfectly and you are done with them. They're permanent. If you want to add features, you put them together in different ways. But these little building blocks, you don't keep reinventing a brick because you want to build a, a larger wall. Okay, so we build a brick. We build a brick called visviva underscore v that does that computation for us. And if I did it right, that code won't need any changes in the future unless I decide let's make it faster. <clears throat> anyway, so how do we apply it? Uh, our process of getting to our orbit involves raising our apoapsis twice. The first is during ascent, when we are ascending through the atmosphere and we're fighting the atmosphere and we're pushing our, and we just always want to be at full throttle anyway. Um, but it's nice to know uh, what velocity you should be at to have your apoapsis be correct so we know to throttle down the engine as we get close to it. So we could leave it, you know, the old way was leave it at full throttle until you had high enough and then you Miko, main engine cut off. And then because this is KSP and I can turn the engines back on, I bip the engines now and then to keep at the altitude. Or the original formulation was simply burn until you're above a certain altitude, then shut off the engine, and you get what you get. Well, I can use VSFIVA. This is my replacement for the ascent phase. Uh, we do our normal thing, which says, you know, if we are good enough, if, uh, remember we had that wait until we're out of the atmosphere when we added the little bipping of the engine to, to uh, make sure we kept our altitude. We still have that logic, so we are going to stay in this phase until our, peri our apoapsis is high enough and we're out of the atmosphere. We do all the same things for figuring out our pitch program, so that's not changed. So altitude fraction and pitch wanted and steering direction and so on, that's unchanged. So what do we want to do here? Um, <clears throat> We want to set our throttle so that we get enough thrust, which is force, to accelerate the vehicle with its mass at a given acceleration so that we would match the desired speed in a fixed amount of time, where the smaller the time, the higher the gain. And the way these proportional controllers work is in a theoretically perfect world, um, your speed would approach the target speed because you know you basically the closer you get the slower you get and that looks a lot like a, a exponential of a negative kind of a curve so you exponentially hone in um, there are ways to write this that uh, come in along a square root so your your velocity comes down linearly as your position comes down as a square root or square, all very fancy, but as it turns out, a proportional controller is extremely simple to write, extremely simple to use, and has been used for so many decades that they understand the math of this really, really well. So control theory calls this a P controller. Um, there's more complex versions. There's a PI controller where you have the P, which is uh, 
your control is some something that is proportional to your error plus something that is i, which is proportional to the integral of your error. So you add up your integral over time. And PI controllers do things like uh, if you need a steady state thrust to maintain your velocity, the integrator will wind up to give you that. And then when you're going too fast, it'll come back down. Effectively, the PI controller, if you're controlling your velocity, will also make sure your position is moving in synchronization with a destination position. We're not going to go there. This is just a P controller. Really simple. So we look at our current speed, velocity orbit mag, so speed all along the orbit. And then we look at Vsviva and say, hey, Vsviva, if we were at, if we're for somebody at our current altitude, with APWAPS is set to our destination target orbit, and at the same periapsis we've got right now. So they take our current orbit we're on and change one thing, which is our apoapsis. How fast should we be moving? And that gives us our desired speed because we are just going to thrust right along our forward direction and we know that that will tend, uh, well, we're not, actually, no, we're not thrusting along our forward direction. We are thrusting along our pitch program. We're not really interested in what happens to the, to the periapsis. So we don't want that factoring in. So we just say, yeah, just keep the periapsis where it is, extend our orbit altitude, that's our speed. We calculate the change in speed, multiply by the gain to get the acceleration. Gain is in one over seconds, by the way, if you want to do units. Uh, if we have acceleration, F equals MA. So force wanted is the mass times acceleration wanted. Force is just thrust. So if we take the force wanted and divide by our available thrust, we get throttle wanted. And from time to time, we will stage during this maneuver. So if we're staging, I don't want available thrust to be zero. We would bomb out here. Um, the older way I was doing it was if available thrust was zero, I set our thrust to zero and we just went on. Um, that was weak in that we had to call this function, you know, very, very rapidly so that we would rapidly respond rather than jerking our, our stuff around. But instead, I've used lock. Basically, lock says, uh, if somebody wants the value of speed change wanted, instead of having a value in the variable, it's actually a function that gets called and recomputes each time. So each time we ask for force wanted, it recomputes acceleration wanted. So it recomputes this. It does all of this computation every time somebody asks for this. So what I want is a value that I can lock. Oops. <laughs> that was a bug. I want a value that I can lock that will, as we flip between available thrust being big and available thrust being zero, we don't crash our program. So now we take the force wanted and we divide it by the maximum force available. And that gives us the throttle setting. Now, if our amount of thrust goes down, our throttle setting is going to go up. And if our amount of thrust goes down to nearly zero, our amount of throttle is going to go really high. It's like set this throttle to 10 billion percent. Okay, so we use clamp. So throttle wanted needs to be in the range of zero to one. So basically, while we are staging, there's a good chance that our throttle will just be set to one, which is not bad. It means when we're done staging, we let off the engine. Uh, until we have an available thrust estimate, that engine's going to be full throttle, uh, which will be what we want because we've been sitting there with no thrust during the, the period where we're doing the staging. So I've looked at this, especially during during a, a ascent phase. Um, if you set up your staging so that, you know, from stage, you know, you, you get these engines burning, and if your staging is such that you've got no engines burning for a couple of seconds, you really want that next engine to come on full thrust. So that's our clamp thrust. The other thing we are doing during the ascent is if we are pointed the wrong way, literally pointed the wrong way, we turn off the frickin' engines. So this is something we've seen before where we take our facing air, which is the direction we're facing, the angle between that and the direction we want to steer. So we've got a steering direction we locked up here. So take that angle and we divide it by our maximum error. So that'll range from zero to one. 
well, it might go past one. So it starts from zero and it goes positive. And it crosses one where we are equal to our maximum facing error, which is a configured parameter. And for the ascent phase, uh, we have a lot of aerodynamic forces on the rocket that are going to turn it and twist it. And the, the only time we really want to turn off our thrust is if we are literally pointed backwards. So at 90 degrees, we will... Yep, cat tax. At 90 degrees, we will chop our throttle to zero. Now she, she may want to be picked up. We'll find out. We'll use the same logic again in our uh, match the Apple Apsis code, which is why I'm going over it here. Uh, so we have an error in degrees. We have an error factor, which is one minus that ratio clamped to zero to one. So error factor is going to be zero for pointed exactly the right way. And it's going to roll off to one. Uh, there should be one if we pointed the right way and roll off to zero when we get to our maximum error. And past our maximum error, it stays at zero. So for the discounted throttle, which is what we're actually going to use, we take the throttle value that we wanted and we reduce it by our facing error. So if we wanted 90% throttle and we're pitched up to 45 degrees away, we're gonna cut that in half. So reduce the throttle as we, as we face away and we lock our throttle to it. And we'll see that when I, when I actually fly this mission, we'll see what happens to it. So that's our, our ascent phase. Again, simple proportional controller of the throttle based on how much velocity we need to add to us right now to have our apoapsis be at the correct altitude. And in practice, uh, once we get there, uh, atmospheric drag is going to slow us down a little bit and we'll let up the engines a little bit and it's going to slow us down and we're going to let up the engines and it's going to slow, it will end up um, with us sitting between one and three percent and our throttle will go down to very low and as we get higher and higher it will drop off further and further until finally it simply goes away so what about the other place where we are changing our apoapsis this is a new phase called phase match apoapsis, and I've got a whole bunch of new parameters that come in to control this. Um, there's how high we're going. I yes, we do have a we have a match gain, which is how aggressive we're going to be about matching our velocities. We have a distinct facing error value. So all of these places in the code where I'm saying roll off throttle based on how far we are facing away from where we are. Each phase has a distinct tunable for it because some phases are going to be more sensitive to the direction we're facing than others. As we saw, ascent was not at all sensitive. Uh, when we did circularization, it was fairly sensitive. I think it was 15 degrees. Now for this one, um, this is going to be a long, slow burn where at the end of it, we're going to be burning very, very low thrust. And I really want to be pointed the right way because if we're pointed the wrong way, there's going to be a lot of delta V built up in the wrong way, which is going to move us around in ways we don't like. So we're going to allow five degrees. And finally, uh, how close do we want our apoapsis to get? Now, I want this to be precise. Now, we're completely in space at this point. Uh, KSP basically says once I'm outside the atmosphere, there is zero atmospheric drag. You know, it will even simulate us on rails. It will say, oh, you're on a Kepler in orbit. We know the body at the center of the sphere of influence, and we can calculate exactly where you are at any given time. We can jump forward by 100 days, and we'll know you're exactly there as long as your orbit doesn't intersect a, a edge of an SOI, either leaving the one you're in or going into the, the moon. This means that we can be exceedingly precise. And I'm going to say, well, originally I just said if round apoapsis was correct. Well, we're going to say if our apoapsis is within half a meter of our destination, we're done. And I actually ran this a few times to get a feel for it. I originally thought, oh, within 100 meters, uh, surely we can get within 100 meters. It won't take too long. Well, 100 meters was easy. Uh, half a meter, we fiddle around a little bit at low thrust, but we get there. Um, 
10 times more precise, we get, takes a little longer. We can, we can mess with that number. And again, the mission can set that as a persistent value on boot, and we will monitor it. Okay, so desired speed, we're again using the simplified Vis Viva, uh, where we just give the uh, altitude, the apoapsis and periapsis, and we can give those in either order. Um, oh, and if we don't specify one, we'll use altitude. So I could just say altitude, apoapsis, and would say, what's our correct speed if, if we were at the periapsis of a orbit with that apoapsis? Uh, again, for what we're doing here, uh, I don't particularly care about move, care to move the periapsis, so I am going to just say my correct speed for current periapsis and desired apoapsis and get the vis viva velocity. Desired speed, current speed, this looks a heck of a lot like the other one. Speed change wanted. They say, oh, looky here. Um, if the apoapsis is above the matched quantity minus the grace, so within half a meter, I'm going to print some stuff. Now, the reason why I did this computation before this is I wanted to print out uh, not just the error in the apoapsis, but I wanted to print out what the error in the speed was. I was curious, and it's kind of a cool thing to look at. Um, we'll see when we get there. If I put that closed brace up there, I can tell VS Code to fold that away, and we can see our entire mainline function with our with our little uh, here's how our how our exit here's our exit condition fold away the code to do the exit. Now we can see the rest of this. We've got speed change wanted, same computations before, acceleration wanted, force wanted, maximum force we're going to get clamped to be always positive. How much throttle we would want. Uh, to achieve it, and then clamp that. And now we go down to here. What's our desired direction? Uh, again, for the ascent, we had a special pitch program. And for this, I always want to thrust prograde because I want all of our energy to go into expanding our apoapsis. And I believe for what we're doing, prograde does that best. Uh, Prograde is the is if if nothing else, it is thrusting in the direction that increases your kinetic energy perfectly. So this should be the most efficient way to add orbital energy, and you want to increase your SOE because in the long run, we're going to do two things: we're going to raise our apoapsis, and then we're going to later circularize. And any increase we get in periapsis is not wasted. We don't want to focus on it, but it's not wasted. So we focus now on increasing our orbital energy to get to the right value, and later when we circularize, we'll have to add more orbital energy there to get our, our uh, periapsis up. So direction is prograde. Compute our facing error, and facing error factor just like before. There's our discounted throttle. And then we can lock our steering and throttle. We use locks on all of this again. So I only have to call this once every five seconds. But in between, every time KSP looks at steering and throttle, it will recalculate all of these values. It won't recalculate the termination condition, but it'll recalculate the rest. Oh, the other thing I do is um, if we are actively working here, I'm going to call a support function that uh, assures us that time warp is off. So you cannot do a on rails warp during this process. Um, that is something I'm still looking forward to. Apparently in KSP2, uh, everything works properly for that. I've been told, oh, you can time warp with thrust turned on. So if you have uh, a little electrical engine and you've got a half hour burn, you don't have to start the burn and turn on SAS and go get dinner. <laughs> you can warp through it, which is really neat because one, one of the missions I want to do eventually in KSP is a mission where literally you have a constant thrust engine. This is actually a interesting mission profile I saw a decade ago. Uh, there's a lot of software written to support this. Uh, you have a little spacecraft and it's got a trivial amount of thrust, but it always has the same amount of thrust. And all you can do is change the direction it's thrusting. 
So you do things like, you know, you, you point straight if you want to accelerate that way. And if you want to reduce acceleration, you start rotating like this so that really the amount of thrust you're getting is the cosine of the angle of your of your cone. And the, as you go around the cone, you're canceling out the laterals that you're introducing because it's just like this. And if you don't want to go anywhere at all, you just spin like this. Really neat stuff. And there was a lot of code written by some very smart people, one very smart person in particular whose name just escapes me, uh, to do a whole mission like this, all the way from Earth orbit all the way out to Jupiter, and to go actually visit the icy moons. Uh, awesome, awesome piece of optimization. Anyway, can't do that in KSP because you would literally have to sit there with KSP running for a year. <laughs> Oops. Anyway, so to get back from my intense digression, we now have a bit of code that will match our apoapsis. So I've got maybe 10 minutes left that I want to keep running this stream. So I'm going to go ahead and do this launch, which I have done before to verify that it works. Although you just saw me change code. <gasps> live coding, live debugging. Oh no, whatever shall we do? Let's take a look at our vessel before we go. We are flying the jovially hesitant request. Oops, no, we are not. We are flying the quickly concerned tramp. Configuration A, flight one. And I want a separate go script for each one of these because the script itself has to have the career, the career uh, to the contract parameters embedded in it. So it's got those four numbers in it. Periapsis, apoapsis, inclination, and, and um, longitude of the ascending nodes. Got those four numbers. To remember, don't actually define the orbit well enough, but it defines an orbit on the correct plane with the correct apoapsis and periapsis. We'll see what it does. So here is the quickly concerned tramp, A01. Uh, call sign would be tramp1. Now, if we look at the actual satellite. Uh, normally you would build your satellite and then you would you know stack stuff on below it but this is can you imagine the aerodynamics of this chunk of stuff? So I used an engine plate which basically goes on top of something like an engine and it provides a attachment point further down. So you see how this is just kind of hanging down here and it provides a shroud. And the reason why I wanted to use the engine plate was for this shroud. Boom! I've got a shroud over my rather irregularly um, irregularly uh, shaped satellite. And I put a nose cone on it, and this is a nice, sleek aerodynamic craft that won't be too weird going up through the answer. I have no idea whether I actually need the shroud or not. Uh, KSP may, may just uh, not look at If I have a nose cone on there, it may just simply not even look at the rest of it. Uh, or it might. But the rocket scientist in me, the little rocket science that I learned and the little of that that I've, remain, I've remembered, doesn't like the idea of having that thing showing like that. So we'll, we'll use a shroud. Our staging is simple. We've got a uh, powerful engine at the bottom with some fuel. And this gets us uh, 1,800 delta V, which, as we've seen before, is almost enough to get us up to our parking orbit. And separately, we are staging the uh, launch gantry. So there'll be a short pause between igniting the engine and releasing the gantry. And then we separate. Once we have fired all of this and gotten our 1862 delta V minus whatever we lose, we will stage and we will open up this engine. Now, that's going to be at a fairly high altitude, and that particular engine is a carrier. So it's actually much, much more capable in vacuum. We'll be at high altitude, so we'll get a great deal more than 400 meters per second. Uh, as we see here, we go from 400 meters per second at sea level up to four times that in vacuum. So 
this engine will actually carry us through uh, getting getting into our parking orbit and I believe it even has some left after that so at some point we will run out of that stage and we will do the final staging which actually will discard the shroud uh, we'll end up keeping the nose comb uh, I was going to put in another uh, another separator to separate off the nose cone, but it didn't really seem to make a, enough of a difference. So that will be our, our satellite. It includes the nose cone and the, and the plate. Uh, and it's got a little engine here. This is a new. This is something that I just had to, re had to uh, open out on research. Um, it is the Spark, which is only 20 kilonewtons. It's one-third the power of the Terrier, and it's much smaller. Uh, it's got a really, really nice ISP on it. We're running ISP of 320 in vacuum, uh, which is good and efficient. And we've got a couple of small fuel, uh, small engines here. This is more than enough to get us to uh, the rest of the way to our target orbit. And the cat is going off again. Let's put the shroud back on. And let's go ahead and launch. And the cat is going to help us watch the launch. Oh, and I just heard a bleep. Something went wrong in the code. Yes, uh, Greg is an idiot, but you all knew that. So let's fix that. So inside, yeah, I said local v2 is equal to. Well, that's never going to work. Uh, local v2 is. I made the mistake yesterday of writing some Python code. And it took me a while to get back into using semicolons instead of dots and equals instead of two. And now I go back to KOS and I'm trying to write Python. So that should have fixed that. Did I see anything else here? I didn't use equal signs anywhere else. So let's turn off the editor and reboot our spacecraft. And we are auto launching. I am going to refill my coffee and see if the cat will deign to join us. So while we changed the ascent phase, you shouldn't see any difference in operation right up to the point where we used to be doing Miko. So as our apoapsis gets close to our target parking altitude, instead of cutting off the engine and then bursting it, the engine should throttle down gracefully. And we're not there yet. Okay. Okay, that's a cat that wants to watch the screen. Go on, Lucy. Oh. There we go. My cool pilot. Lucy helps me write code. I explain how things work to her. And she makes me sit back and read my code and think about it. Rather than just blast the code in and try it like I just did. Okay, and there is the equivalent of main engine cutoff. We have throttled back the engines to where we are now very slowly creeping our apoapsis up to the target value. Uh, we have some atmospheric drag, which is slowing us down a little bit, which is maintaining this tension. Uh, it's a proportional controller, so we will not uh, stabilize at the target. We stabilize just under the target at a difference, at a altitude error, which is just enough to cause us to burn the engine, just enough to counteract the atmospheric drag at that speed. 79,999. And this is going to be very fast to transition from ascent to circularization. 
So we're about to exit the atmosphere. And there we go, phase coast. So notice we exited the atmosphere and as soon as our apoapsis hit 80 kilometers, we went into coast phase. And we're basically going to do nothing until the pre-programmed time when we want to actually circularize. And that is in 35 seconds. If I were going to time warp before this, I would stop my warp 30 seconds before. So here we are, we're doing our circularization. Notice the throttle goes up and down as we try to get our nose pointed in the right direction. Our nose is pointed slightly down because our velocity is, we're still ascending just a little bit. Circ says circularize at the current altitude. So if you're still ascending, it will try to halt your ascent by including a radial inward component on the thrust. But because there's so much horizontal velocity to make up, it's almost a lateral burn. And now we've gone past our apoapsis, and there we are. And there's getting into orbit. And our circularization is complete. After a short pause, we are now in phase match apoapsis. Notice that at the end of circularization, I went ahead and printed the uh, difference between periapsis and apoapsis. So we, we brought them within uh, 13 and a half meters of each other. Good enough for a parking orbit. Their speed error was 12 centimeters. Oh, let's see. No, 1.2 centimeters per second. Our velocity error was very low. But if you think that's low, hold on to your socks. So Match Apoapsis is reaching for 4.5 million meters. And it has just achieved it. And now it's just barely, barely shaving. The throttle is so low we can't even see it here. There it is. Phase match complete. Uh, our apoapsis was two-tenths of a meter from where we wanted it. And our final speed error was four times ten to the minus six meters per second. Wow. Um, that's four micrometers per second. So it's a millionth of a meter a micron? I thought a micron was a thousandth of an inch. Anyway, that's a really tiny, tiny speed error. So now we, we are coasting. And that's as much of the uh, delivery system as I have discussed so far on the math. If you look at the, at the map here, I probably should have been showing this as we inflated the orbit. It's really kind of cool to see the orbit inflate. In fact, I think I'm going to rewind and do it and run it again from the map view. Um, this is Apoap. Oh, before we do that, our Apoaps is 455777. Apoaps is our target orbit is 4557075. So apparently, after I printed this, here, uh, we did get a change, so I might want to, if I wanted, if I wanted this to be logged exactly, what I would have to do is cut the engines, wait a couple of seconds, and then print what the actual final error values were. But it's kind of cool to see what the values were when we made the decision to terminate. So let's do that again from map view. KOS, terminal on. Okay, so here's our starting point. And I've got our our view set so we can see our apoapsis over there. Actually, if I move my terminal to the right, I can zoom this in a little more. And we're actually going to intercept this somewhere further along the apoapsis. 
if we were really clever, we could have timed our launch so that we joined the destination orbit at its apoapsis. Um, that may be what we need to do. If it, tur if it turns out that we have to match periapsis and apoapsis for the contract to complete, uh, we may need to jigger our mission start time, or our launch time, to do that match. Which may involve doing a whole bunch of, oh, fly it, oh, rewind and fly it again, oh, rewind and fly it again, because I don't think we can compute things precisely enough given the presence of the atmosphere. Although the first flight, we could see where our apoapsis was and compare it with a desired apoapsis, and we know the angular change, so we can just, you know, uh, roll back in time by, you know, the correct amount to change our angle. So we're still on the, on the ascent, and at our launch, our, you see our apoapsis there is reaching our parking orbit. Let's adjust the map so that the transfer orbit will tend to be right to left. Now bear in mind that the plane of the target orbit is offset from the plane of carbon by one degree. And the plane of our orbit may also be offset from the plane of carbon by so about. So when we pick up again, we're going to be dealing with um, adjusting our orbital inclination. And I found a clever way to do that. We'll see it. Okay, so coasting. Lucy likes it when I don't have to do anything on the keyboard. So this stream went long because I decided to do a second flight. So there's circularizing at the initial parking orbit. Notice how the orbit is lifting itself out of Kerbin. spark to finish circularization. There we go, perhaps this is up and we are circularized. You notice when we're close to circularization our apoapsis and periapsis move around. They're not stable. The distances are stable but their positions are not, which makes me not trust anything that gives the that, that tries to do computations manipulating the arguative periapsis because it can change very rapidly when you're in a nearly circular orbit. So that sound of a balloon beam being uh, blown up is just the sound of the orbit being inflated. And there we go. Apoapsis is now 4555, 4556, And there we go, there's the match. And they are being displayed as the same integer number of meters. And this time, our apoapsis error was 0.3, but they both round to the same integer. And our speed error was seven times 10 to the minus seventh, so seven tenths of a millionth of a meter. Wow. Um, so the rest of this insertion will be coasting up to apoapsis, and then we'll do another inflation. We'll inflate our periapsis out so that circular. So we're going to circularize on orbit. And once we've circularized, then we deal with the fact that these are not all on the same orbital plane. Uh, the error isn't big. Uh, our 
current inclination is 0 0.098 degrees. So my current ascent script, which explicitly holds our launch azimuth, does a pretty good job of, of keeping us in the orbital plane. It's off by a little bit. Our target orbit uh, differs by one degree. Because there's a descending node there of one degree. So in theory, I believe what we need to do is get into a circular orbit and then adjust our inclination and then adjust our eccentricity to match. So we get our periapsis and apoapsis correct. Uh, the numbers they gave me, the contract, could equally have placed periapsis and apoapsis anywhere on this circle. And given that this is a nearly circular orbit, uh, the amount of velocity change at any point on the orbit to change where they are is very small. So as it turns out from a test flight, I know that once I get the inclination right in a circular orbit, it satisfies the contract. So there will be contracts in the future for more uh, eccentric orbits where we will have to use more logic than what we have to do here. Anyway, so the next phase will be for me to come back with the correct math for orbital inclination changes, which is a whole new set of math and probably another hour long video. Uh, this has been a half an hour plus 45 minutes. Um, and I think we have covered Vis Viva and using it to control our thrust, our, our burn termination when we are raising our apoapsis to a given target. I think this proves that you can do that very precisely. So um, I'm going to revert this. So that when we come back to do inclination, we'll end up flying these parts again so that our inclination code is on board when we're doing it. I will see you then.